Hey, if it's your first time here, if it's your first time back in a long time, we welcome you. We thank you because it is a big, big deal for us that you would take the time out of your busy weekly schedule to come hang out with us on a Wednesday evening. If it's your first time, uh, right to your on, on your left-hand side, in the back corner here, we have a Get Connected table. We have a gift for you. If it's your first or second time, even your third time back, uh, we want to make sure that you don't go home empty-handed because we want to just we want to just exemplify how how much it means to us uh, that you would just take the time to come hang out with us. My name is Danny. I'm honored to be a pastor here at Hope Chapel. And what we're going to be doing next is we're going to be looking at a portion of Scripture. The reason why we do that on a weekly basis is because we find it so imperative for us to be fed the Word of God. I don't know about you guys, but I I got a devil to fight. Anybody with me? How many of you guys, the devil will try to defeat and discourage you at all times? And it's not just Wednesday. Sometimes for you it's Saturday evenings, but it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The devil's always trying to, trying to do something to trip you up. And so that's why we do that. And we're going to be looking at a very, very fam uh, familiar portion of Scripture this evening. Um, if you're new to the church setting or if you're not new to the church setting, uh, you're probably going to be really familiar with the story of David and that's right, David and Goliath. So uh, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to invite you to open up your Bible to the first book of Samuel, and we're going to be in chapter 17. First book of Samuel, chapter 17, and we're going to be reading verses 24 all the way down to verse 37. Hey, if you do not have a Bible, no worries. One, we forgive you. Two, you can follow along with the words that are going to be displayed on the screen. Aren't you grateful that we have volunteers that get here early to make sure you can be able to read along if for, for whatever reason you do not have a Bible. Are you guys grateful for that? Yes. About 15 of us are grateful for that. Praise God for those 15 people. Praise God. It's going to be displayed on the screen for you. Hey, before I get started, my voice is a little, what we call in my, in my culture, ronco. I'm not sick. Uh, my girlfriend uh, it, it surprised me with the Disneyland tickets. I went with great friends, and I had, I had a blast. I lost my voice on Space Mountain. So I want to let you know I'm not sick. You can't give me a hug. You can't shake my hand. I'm just, as what we say, ronco. Anyways, 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to start in verse 24. If you're there, say, I'm there. If you have the same Bible I have, I'm on page 378. If you need more time, say, I need more time. Take your time. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 24, we read the gospel in the name of the Father, Son, and, and in the, Holy the Bible goes a little something like this. And the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and, much, and were very much afraid. We're in verse 24. And just so you know, due to the sake of time, we're going to jump in the middle of a story. But I'm going to do my absolute best to provide you with some context. So we're jumping in the middle of a story here. Verse 24. All of the men of Israel, how many men? All of the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were very much afraid. They're talking about Goliath here. Verse 25. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches. I like that. I like riches. What about you? And he will give him his daughter and make his father free his father's house free in Israel and what that's saying is you're tax free come on somebody I know you guys like that tax free in all of Israel and David said to the men who stood by him what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel for who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God and the people answered him in the same way so shall it be done to the man who kills him. Verse 28. Now Eliab, his eldest brother, this is David's eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the man. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why have you come down? And, who, and with whom have you left those sheep in the wilderness with? I know your presumption, your intentions. I know your intentions and the evil of your heart. For you have come down to see the battle. Anybody got any other siblings? For I know the presumption and the evil in your heart. For you have come down to see this battle. And David said, what have I done now? Was it not but a word? And he turned away from him and toward another and spoke in the same way. And the people answered him again as before. Verse 31. When the words that David spoke were heard, 
they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. So Saul said to David, you are, only but, you, you are not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth. I have that highlighted in my Bible. For you are but a youth. And he has been a man of war of his youth. But David said to Saul, bro, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and he took a lamb from the flock, this is what I did. I went after him and I struck him and I delivered it from his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him dead in the jaw and killed him. That's my version. Verse 36, your servant has struck down both lions and bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall go, shall be like one of them. For he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will also deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. Come on, somebody. Yeah. That's faith. And Saul said to David, go. Basically, good luck. May the Lord be with you. Let's read verse 37 together. It says like this. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from Paul the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. I titled this message, Remaining Undefeated. Look at your neighbor and say, Remaining Undefeated. Look at your other neighbor and say, Apologize for, being, for them being your second option. And say, Remaining Undefeated. Before we go on and start uh, diving into the scripture, I want to let you know my objective for tonight. My objective for us to today is for us to know what it's like as sons and daughters of Jesus to remain undefeated. It's one thing to be undefeated. It's one thing to not lose the battle. But how do you remain in that state? How do you continue to be consistent with Jesus Christ? Hey, some of you have been walking with Jesus Christ maybe five months, maybe five years, maybe 55 years. But one of the things that continues, allows us to grow is consistency with the Lord, Savior, God, Jesus Christ. How do we remain that consistency? How do we remain undefeated? Let us pray. God, we thank you so much for this opportunity that you've allowed us to be here tonight. We thank you, God, first and foremost, for waking us up this morning because we know maybe some people didn't. We thank you, God, for little things that sometimes we may overlook on a daily basis, like the air in our lungs, God, the shoes on our feet, the clothes on our back, the money in our pocket, and the food on the table. We thank you, God Almighty, that you created a place and an experience and an environment such as Hope Chapel that allows us to come in on a midweek basis, God, and allows us to honor you and hear from you, Jesus. As we are in this space, Jesus, with a, with a heart of gratitude and thankfulness, I pray that you will speak to us in a profound way. If anybody came in this place, God, hopeless, I pray, Father, that you will send them filled with hope today. I pray, God Almighty, that you will speak to us in ways that we're not used to. I pray that you will show up to us in our lives in ways that we need you the most, God. Only you know exactly what's going on in our circumstances. Only you know exactly what's going on in our hearts, in our mind, in our situations. And we need you, Father. And I pray, Father, that tonight will be the night that you show up. I pray tonight we break chains, Father. I pray tonight that we will see the devil flee for our homes. Because we believe that the devil will not have his way with our sons and daughters. We believe that the devil will not have his way with our occupations we believe that the devil will not have his way father with our church our community even our state even our nation god because we believe in a god that is whole that is well and that is alive god we rebuke the devil right now when we start praying that you start shifting an atmosphere god that only you can permeate no club no stadium no bar can permeate and shift the atmosphere the way you can holy spirit we invite and invoke you in this place today as we continue to worship you and give you honor and give you glory Please teach us what it's like to remain undefeated. In Jesus' name we pray. And the church says, amen, amen, and amen. Come on, if you're grateful to God, won't you give God a praise where you're sitting right now? I'm almost done with my sermon. Hey, it's hot outside, amen. When I was five years old, I'll give you a quick story. When I was five years old, I picked up a basketball. It changed my life, absolutely changed my life. I remember dribbling five, six years old, and I would shoot everything with my left hand, and nothing was going in. At five years old, brick, brick, 
brick. Thankfully, my mom and my dad bought me a basketball court. I wasn't making anything. And then I realized maybe I'm right-handed. Started shooting everything with my right hand, ladies and gentlemen. And all you would hear was, what is that? It's the sound of nothing but net. Five years old. And at five years old, at five, six years old, I remember I had aspirations of going to the NBA. I'm telling you, I was five years old. I had it all planned out. I was going to go to the Los Angeles Lakers. I was going to be the youngest person ever in history to be drafted into the NBA. I was going to come right out of middle school. And I was going to play for the Los Angeles Lakers. I had it all planned out. I was going to move my parents into a Malibu mansion so they could see the sunrise and the sunset over the Pacific Ocean. I had it all planned out. And then when I get to high school, I realize, why am I still not in the NBA? Because what was happening, there was a problem, church. I was seeing the bench more than I was seeing the floor. And then I start to question, what is going on? Because you know how we get when we have it all planned out. And don't we wrestle with God? And sometimes even questions God's existence or love for us when we have it all planned out. And one thing that I've realized and one thing that I've learned being an athlete is that a lot of the things that we've experienced in my context, which was a basketball court, you played sports, it might have been a field, it might have been a, it might have been a pool, whatever it was, but a lot of the things that we've experienced on the court was a direct result of what was going on in the locker room. See, in the locker room, when you're an athlete, is the time and the place where you get to encourage one another. In my generation, we say, we hype each other up. You play a song, we slap each other upside the head, because we're crazy. But we do whatever we can to hype each other up. See, the locker room is where you encourage each other, but also the locker room is the place where we can call each other's mistakes out. The locker room is the experience right before the game and sometimes right in the middle of the game so that way your team can be on one accord. The reason why I share that with you is because the verses that we just read are David's locker room experience before he goes into the battlefield. And we see four conversations that David has before he ever steps foot of in the battlefield. And David gets a lot of credit for being able to step out into the battlefield and face Goliath, a nine-foot giant, and overcoming him. But I don't think he gets enough credit for being who he already was before he stepped into the battlefield. See, as Christians, we also have our locker room experience. Before we go to setbacks, before we go through financial or health setbacks, before we go through bro uh, broken relationships, whatever it may be that the devil or life may throw at us, because how many of you guys know that life has a way of throwing us curveballs? We also have our locker room experience. And what I want to do tonight is I want to look at these four conversations that David has that allowed him to remain undefeated so therefore, he can step into the battlefield and overcome his giant. How many of you guys got giants to fight? These four conversations will help us overcome our giants. And the best thing about this is free of charge. The first conversation that we see David have is with soldiers. In verse 26, the Bible tells us that he ends up having a conversation with people who are part of the army. Now you have to remember, church, that the reason why David is there to begin with is because he was obedient to his father. And his father had David take his brother down some, he had his brother, uh, he had his father take him down some food. Because the, uh, David's oldest brother, eldest brother, Eliab, was a part of the army. In my culture, we call this queso fresco. I would have took him down some pan dulce. Anybody know what I'm talking about? People who don't speak Spanish like, huh? I would have took them down some pan dulce, some queso fresco, because I'm being obedient to my father. There's no reason for him to be there, only because he's applying what his father told him to do. And because he's obedient, he takes his queso fresco, and he takes his pan dulce, and he makes his way down to where the army was, and he's getting ready to give his brother some food. And the soldiers notice that he's there, and they're afraid because Goliath sighs. And notice what David says in verse 26. The Bible says it like this. He says, and David said to the men who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach of Israel? This is the difference between David and the rest of the men. 
before he ever stepped foot on the battlefield to confront David, to confront Goliath. The difference between David and Goliath, David and the rest of the men, is while the rest of the men were focused on defeat, David was focused on victory. While the, the, while the men were focused and pulling out the resume of Goliath and how tall he was and how impossible it was to defeat him, what does David do? He's not focused about his resume. He's focused on the victory. He even asked, him, he even asked him, well, what's in it for me? How do I benefit if I defeat Goliath? And they tell him, you'll be free of taxes. The king will give you his daughter, and you'll be good to go. He was focused on the victory and if we're going to remain undefeated in every season of our life here's my first point this evening we have to have a vision of victory over our lives because i am a strong believer church that where people have no vision they will perish and david is not focused on the resume he's not focused on the defeat and that's how sometimes we don't become undefeated it's because we're focused on how we're going to lose or we're focused on what we can't do, rather what God can do in us and through us. We're focused on how unexperienced we may be or how small we are in comparison to the battle or in comparison to the mountain that's been placed before us. But if we're going to be victorious in every single season of our life and we're going to be undefeated Christians, sons and daughters in a community that is undefeated, we have to know what it's like to have a vision of victory over our lives. And because David had a vision of victory over his life, he knew that he served a God that wasn't only going to get him to the battle, but he was going to get him through the battle. And here's why I think we can preach off that. Because we serve a God that got Moses not to the Red Sea, but he got him through the Red Sea. We serve a God that's whole, well, and alive, that didn't just get the Israelites to the wilderness, but he got them through the wilderness. Didn't God just also get Daniel in, not just to the lines then, but he got him through the lines then. God, we, ladies and gentlemen, we serve a God that didn't get three Hebrews men to a fiery furnace, but he got them through the fiery furnace. And the good news is, church, it doesn't even stop there. In the New Testament, he didn't get Lazarus to the tomb, but he got him through the tomb. And we serve a God that sent his one and only begotten son. And that he didn't get him to death, but ladies and gentlemen, he got him through death. David had a vision of victory over his life. And where people have no vision, people will perish. No wonder why sometimes we get discouraged. No wonder why sometimes we can't continue. No wonder why sometimes we want to hang up, the th- hang up our gloves and throw in a towel. Because we don't see ourselves already victorious to begin with. We don't fight for victory. We're fighting from victory because of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross over 2,000 years ago. When Jesus Christ resurrected, ladies and gentlemen, he didn't resurrect just like we resurrect out of bed. He resurrected with power, and he resurrected with authority. And that same power and that same authority now lives in us. David had a vision of victory over his life. And if we never have a vision of our victory, we'll always be stuck. No wonder why sometimes our churches can't have any anointing in them. Because we got to have vision. We have to already see ourselves victorious. We have to already see ourselves ahead of the game. Notice, David was not concerned about defeat. He already had the victory in mind. Well, what's in it for me? Because I'm about to take it. That's the first conversation we see David have. The second conversation we have with David, we see David have, is a conversation he has with his oldest brother, Eliab. The Bible says that when he gets down there in around verse 29, Eliab says, what are you doing here? What really caught my attention about this conversation is the word now. And you see the word now in verse 29. And it says it like this. And David said, what have I done now? Because now what we see in the first book of Samuel, it's painting us a picture that David and Eliab probably don't have the best relationship. There's already tension before David even gets there. And the reason why some scholars believe David had tension with the rest of his brothers is because some people believe that Jesse may have had an affair outside of his marriage. And therefore, there's, that's where David was conceived from a different marriage. This is not theologically correct, but some scholars, some historians believe that this may be the reason why David was never uh, 
in the, in the chapter before, was never invited to see who was going to be anointed as king because he was encountered like the rest of the brothers. So by the time he shows up, there's already tension on the second conversation. And notice it's also the shortest conversation that David has amongst the rest of the four. And Eliab says, whom did you leave your sheep with? Notice what Eliab, his oldest brother, is doing. He starts to belittle David. And he reminds David what he should be doing instead of being where he's at. And when people don't have a vision for themselves, they'll have the audacity to think that you can't take it where they never could. Because where David has a vision for victory, his eldest brother has a vision of fear. Because if his brother had a vision of victory, his brother would be out in the battlefield. He's already upset at David because his presence is there. And what does David do? He cuts the conversation short. Because my second point of this evening, not only do you have to, not only point number one, do you have to have a vision of victory, but point number two, you have to be selective with whom you allow to speak into your spirit. Even as Christians, it's okay to cut the conversation short and say, God bless you. I'm out of here. Notice what David's brother is trying to do to David. He's trying to discourage him and remind him of the occupation he's supposed to be doing. And basically he's trying to tell him, you're not even supposed to be here. You're not a warrior. You're not a soldier. You're just a shepherd. Stay in your place. And where people have no vision for themselves, they'll try to make you feel like you don't have a vision for yourself. And just because they didn't have the courage or the, the, the tenacity and the strength nor the wisdom to take it further, they'll try to put it on us to make it seem like we couldn't be able to do it ourselves. And when you have these type of people trying to speak into your spirit, here's what you do, church. You cut the conversation short and you keep pressing towards what God has called you to do. Because that's what the devil will try to make you think. He will try to make you think that you're too small, that you're too little, you're too inexperienced, you don't have enough education, you don't have enough, uh, your background's not strong enough. Just like what Eliab was trying to do with his brother. And the truth is, church, there's some people, even within churches, that have an Eliab spirit. They'll try to discourage you. They'll try to make it seem like you're not good enough. They'll try to make it seem like you got to stay in your place. But when you know you have a calling over God in your life, you are willing to do whatever it takes to make sure you see the vision of victory over your life. David has a vision of victory and he's also selective with whom he allows to speak into your spirit. And how many of you guys know haters gonna hate? His brother's already upset that he's there. Where did you leave your sheep? And notice not, not only does he say where did you leave your sheep? He says where did you leave those few sheep? Don't allow anyone or anything discourage you and what God has called you to. David has a vision of victory over his life. And when you have a vision of victory over your life, church, you have to see yourself as a CEO before you even establish the business. When you have a vision of your life, ladies and gentlemen, you have to see yourself cancer-free before you take the first round of chemotherapy. When you have a vision of victory over your life, you have to see yourself inside the house before you even put money down for the down payment. When you have a vision of victory over your life, church, you have to see yourself in the job before you even go for the interview. David had a vision of victory over his life. And where there is no vision, people will perish. No wonder why sometimes we don't see God move. It's because we don't have a vision for ourselves. No, some, no wonder why sometimes church is closed. It's because they have no vision for themselves. And hey, church, if we're going to remain undefeated, we have to know what it's like to have a vision of victory. And for those who are going to hate, you got to be selective with whom speaks into your spirit. Because that's one of the devil's strategies. He'll try to discourage you. He'll make you think you're not good enough. You're not wise enough. You're not strong enough. You're not tenacious enough. But when you know you have a calling over your life, you're going to keep pressing towards what God has called you to do. Come on, church. He walks away. That's the second conversation he has and the shortest conversation he has. He has a vision of victory over his life. He's selective with who he allows to speak into his spirit. And thirdly, the third conversation he has is with King Saul. Some scholars say that at this point it was possible that he was, he was even his mentor. And notice what King Saul tells him in verse 33. 
you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth. And he has been a man of war from his youth. You can't do it. This is the king. And if scholars are correct, if historians are correct, this is his mentor telling David he's unable to do. Here's what I love David. And here's what we need to learn from David so we can apply it in our lives when we try to fight, when we go up against mountains and when we go up against giants. And if we're going to remain undefeated. Notice how he responds. What does Saul do? He pulls out Goliath's resume. What does David do? He pulls out his resume. In our generation, we'll say, girl. When a, when a lion will try to come and take what was mine, not just the lion. When a bear will try to come and take what was mine, what is David doing? He's drawing from his history with God. And that's why it's so important for you and I to have history with God. Because anytime we try to go against, and anytime the devil tries to go up against us, we can always draw from what, how God's provided for us. We can always draw how God's been there for us, how he's healed us. When we were set back, how he got us through. We can always draw back. We can always draw from what God has done for us. And what is David doing? Point number three, he's aware of his anointing. If we're going to remain undefeated, church, we have to have a vision of victory. Point number two, we have to be selective with whom we allow to speak into our spirit. And point number three, we have to be aware of our anointing. Because if the devil try to discourage us with the Eliab people with people with an Eliab spirit, then the devil will try to discourage with making us think that we'll never be able to accomplish what God has called us to do. If David would have listened to the soldiers, he would have never overcame Goliath. If he would have listened to his own brother, his own family, he would have never overcame Goliath. And isn't it amazing that sometimes the people who discourage us are the people who are closest to us? Oh, y'all not going to talk to me tonight, church. And he's aware of his anointing. He's aware of what God has got him through. He's aware how good and faithful God's been. Are you aware how good God and faithful God's been in your life? Are you aware how God's provided for you? I love that David's able to look, get back in his arsenal. His arsenal was in stones. His arsenal was his history and his relationship with Jesus Christ. He was aware of his anointing. Now let me tell you, now let me define anointing for you. Anointing, I define it as evidence of God in your life. When you can look back in life and say, you know what? That was God. That was God. Anointing does not mean talent. Because you could teach someone to pray, but if there's no anointing in their prayer, chains will never be broken. Anointing doesn't mean a good communicator, a good preacher. Because you could teach a good communicator and a good preacher how to preach. But if they're not anointed, then atmospheres will never shift in a spiritual realm. People's lives will never be changed. People will never be set free because there is no anointing. Anointing does not mean gifted. Just because you can sing well or you can play an instrument does not mean you are anointed. Anointing allows us to feel the presence of the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. It sets people free. It transforms the person. Person's heart. It changes the trajectory of people's life. David was not just talented, he was anointed. And when we have God's anointing over our life, we can see evidence of God throughout our life. And what does David do? He's not worried about Goliath's resume, he pulls out his resume. And you know who's on his resume? Job reference the Lord. He has a vision of victory over his life. He's selective with whom he allows to speak into his spirit, and he's aware of his anointing. That's the third conversation he has. Before he even steps onto the field, before he ever gets his little, his little slingshot, every time I think of, this, of the slingshot, I think of the Little Rascals, the movie The Little Rascals. Before he takes out his sling, he takes out his stone, he's already prepared in his mind for anything that comes his way because he's willing to remain un. Defeated. That's the third conversation we see him have. The fourth conversation we see him have, we didn't read it. And I wanted to save this for last. It's verse 45. And it's with Goliath. And this is what he tells Goliath. He says, you have come with me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin. But I come with you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of armies. Of Israel. I'm going to read that one more time for y'all who sleep on me. You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, 
the God of armies of Israel. Even though David knew he had a vision of victory, even though he was selective of who he spoke into his spirit, and even though he was aware of his anointing, point number four, he never underestimated the power of prayer. Three people said amen. amen. He never underestimated the power of prayer. Yeah. He knew that in order for him to overcome Goliath, he wasn't going to do it by himself. He knew that he needed someone greater. He needed someone more powerful. And he knew that he couldn't do it all by himself. So he adds the Lord in it. And when we're going up, when we're facing our giants, and when we're going through seasons, and we're, we're trying to climb uphill these mountains uh, that have been faced before us, we have to never underestimate the power of prayer. Even if we have a vision of victory, even if we're aware of our anointing, he never underestimated the power of prayer. But here's what I love about David. King Saul tried to give him his gear. He said, nah, man, that doesn't work for me. Because one works, what can work for one generation may not work for another. He tried to give him a helmet. He said, nah, man, that don't work for me. He tried to give him a sword. He said, nah, man, that don't work for me. I love that David was true to himself. He knew what he wasn't and what he was. And I think we need more people in a church today that don't try to be someone's Echo, because God wants to give you your own voice. And that's what David was utilizing. He was exercising his own style, his own method. Despite the method, despite the style, he allowed the Lord to be in there and allowed him to be victorious because he did not underestimate the power of prayer. And you know the story, church. You got to memorize. You recite it every morning when you wake up at 6 a.m. to have devotionals with the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. He got the stone, and he flung it. And where did it hit? It hit Goliath right dead center in the cabecita, in the head. And I was reading an article on this this morning. And this historian was saying how, how the stone was traveling against gravity. And see, Goliath, historically and culturally, should have had an arm barrier. And an arm barrier is what we call today a bodyguard. And it is the arm barrier's job and responsibility to get in the way of anything that can damage or hurt Goliath. And if this is true, and David flung the stone and hit him dead center in the head and is traveling against gravity and hit him right where it needed to hit him for one hit or quitter for him to, pat, to, to die and allow David to be victorious in all of Israel, he could not have done it by himself. And when we utilize the power of prayer in every season of our life, I do believe that we will see and we will realize that there are some things that we cannot do alone. There are some things that we need to pray for. There are some things, there's everything that the, the, the Lord needs to be involved in. We can never underestimate the power of prayer in our life. If we're going to remain undefeated, church, we have to have a vision of victory. If we're going to remain undefeated, we have to be selective with whom we allow to speak into our spirits. Thirdly, we have to be aware of our anointing. And lastly, do never, never underestimate the power of prayer. What does your locker room experience look like today? What are the things you're telling yourself or maybe not telling yourself? What is the strategy the devil is trying to do in your life to keep you from moving forward? from keep you from being happy, or from keep you from serving Jesus. What does your locker room experience look like? And I believe that if we apply these common things, that we'll be able to do things that we never thought we'd be able to do. I don't think David ever thought he was going to be able to beat Goliath, but because he has a relationship with Jesus and he applied these four common things, now in 2021, we're preaching about him and we're learning on how we can also overcome our giants in our life. I don't know what your locker room experience looks like, church. I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. But I do believe that God has called you to be victorious. I do believe that God wants to take you from glory to glory, from victory to victory. And I do believe that God, like David, 
wants us to remain undefeated. So what I want to do today with every eyes closed and every head bowed down, I want to pray for you.